Welcome to another episode of the Catholic Talk Show. Today, we're going to be talking about fatherhood with Father Mark Mary of the CFRs. Yeah, we're going to get the opportunity to talk to Father Mark Mary about his new book, The Father, which contains 30 meditations on fatherhood, both divine, spiritual, and temporal. I'm so excited about learning more about your ministry, Father Mark, and to realize that Jesus's word is still with us, and his word was that the Father's love would abide in us. As the Father loved Jesus, so Jesus has loved us, and he wants us to abide in that love, and you're going to learn all about that in this beautiful episode. Father Mark Mary, welcome to the podcast. This is your first appearance, and we're really grateful to have you here today. Thanks, guys. I'm really, uh, yeah, grateful to be with y'all. So, Father, um, for those of you out there listening who don't know, uh, Father Mark Mary is with the CFRs. He's on a bunch of podcasts. I'm sure you've seen him on Poco a Poco. Um, but he's got this new book, which is focusing on meditations, 30 meditations on the Father. And fatherhood is such a wound in today's society in today's culture i think one of the biggest things that's negatively impacting our ability to love each other to move forward as a society to have a growing church and a growing um, nation is the fatherhood wound that so many people in our world experience so this meditation i think can help us draw us close to even those of us who were lacking in a in a, um, a biological father to find that solace and to find true fatherhood in God the Father. So very exciting. I think a very necessary episode and a very necessary topic to discuss. Yeah, and I, I just, I, I've got to say, like, as as somebody who have had, I've had wonderful fathers in my life, but it, it, as a product of divorce, you know, that, that need for the constancy of a father's love um, is just such a, a fundamental need of all of our hearts. So whether you have the most amazing dad or, or you've never even known your father, um, we all need a heavenly father. And what the heavenly father provides to us is just far more rich than we could ever imagine. So Father Mark Mary, you know, what was the fundamental experience that moved your heart and your love of the father to even approach this work? And, and what was happening for you, like spiritually that, that inspired it? Yeah, you guys, you guys are all over it, and in, in in a certain sense, if you will, the the remote sort of preparation leading to this book actually came from hearing a story about a, a biological father. It ends up being the last chapter of the book, mm. and it's the story of Tom Vanderwoody, who's a dad of five boys, and one of his sons had Down syndrome, and at, at one point, this the son with Down syndrome fell like on their farm, fell into like a a sewage cistern, and mm. and Tom jumped in, jumped in the, the sewage, jumped in the cistern, got below his son, his name is Joseph, Josie, and, um, and held him up. God but in holding his son up that he would live, he ended up drowning and giving oh, his Lord. life. And I heard, I, when I first heard the story, it was, I was sitting next to one of uh, Tom's, you know, granddaughters. And it, it kind of, it like opened my eyes to two, two like really key important components, right? Is just that, the, the first one is this, it's just that this, um, like our fathers, and this is kind of how God intended it to be. And, and it's one of the sadnesses and that it doesn't always happen. Like fathers are supposed to be icons of God, the father. And there's, there's a way in which though the fatherhood of God is a little bit abstract, but the love of an earthly father, father, like really resonates deeply. Right. And so hearing the story, I was so moved, um, by this, by this action of this dad giving his life freely for his son and it just reminded me of like, well, if this is true of an earthly father, how much more true is it of our heavenly father and how invested he in, is in us? And that just this, you know, Jesus coming, right? Jesus coming reveals to us the father and we see the father's heart for us in this way in the life, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so that's kind of where, where it started. And really, as time goes on, I just, I want to know the fatherhood of God. Like I know I'm made for it. I know I need it. I know I want it. And so this book is is my own kind of journey towards that and some of the different stories along the way, which kind of enlightened it. Mm. So you, you talk about some of the stories. So as you were putting this book together, before we start diving into this topic, um, what what made you come up with 30 
reflections? Is that something that you just, instead of piecing together, you had just ways of explaining different aspects of the father's love for us um, in 30 different reflections? Yeah, I think, you know, like a typical book may, might be eight, 10 chapters. And I just had too many stories to limit it to eight or 10. And it's part of, as Franciscans, we don't have a lot of material goods, but we have an incredible wealth of just witnesses and stories mm. of different, different people across the board, not just fathers, right? And so actually kind of organically, all these stories came to mind and came up for my own, for my own childhood, but for my life as a father or as a, as a priest, as a spiritual father, also just from some of the dads we know. And so like I, I, and I believe a lot of these stories, they can emphasize one particular characteristic of the heart of God. So I just had a bunch and I do think they all illumined something different, which is why, and, and 30 seemed like the, the right, the right number, but I mean, as, as you guys know, who are dads, like you, you have 30 stories like this on your own, you <laughs> yeah. know? So there's like a countless number of these. Delacrosse has like 30 kids in all reality, <laughs> but you know, like the, the beauty of it, you know, father is the, the sense that this is personally a part of your charism and knowing father Benedict Groeschel, knowing a number of you guys, um, the charism of storytelling by far far in your religious community is just superior. I mean, I remember just kind of sitting down and, and listening to the brothers, you know, this is 20 years ago. I used to just love going up to the Trinity house and just listening to stories and that, that fraternal aspect of, of your, your charism in your community. It, it is like a convergence of testimony. It's a convergence of story. So the fact that you're referencing that already, that, that this charism of who you are as a religious and as a repository of these testimonies, and now you're integrating that in your life, this story of this father lifting up his child from the sewage, like it's it's integrating it into your own spiritual life and your encounter of the father. So I'm excited to to break this open even more. Yeah. And Father Rich, if I, if I can respond to that, because I think, again, you're like, you guys are just nailing it right now as far as like my heart and, and where I'm coming from, is the, the opening of the book is actually the story of St. Francis. Because mm. one of the things that we, we kind of, a lot of us know, but we skip by real fast, is that like St. Francis is basically disowned by his dad. Mm -hmm. He's taken before the bishop and his dad totally cuts him off. Mm -hmm. And for a human being, you don't just get over that right away. You know, like that's, that's like, that sticks with you, this public official being renounced by your father. And part of my hypothesis or my, what I was wrestling with is, as I really believe like the totality and the radicality with which Francis pursued Jesus is actually flowing from his, like how deep his desire was to know the love of a perfect father. And he knew that in Jesus, he would experience and be revealed like the father and that those desires he had would find healing and fulfillment, mm. but also, right. Like, so St. Francis and, and us, like um, with the life of, of poverty and, and the way in which our charism works is I really believe part of the spirituality and the charism is for us to kind of just to kind of, for us to really experience God's fatherhood in the real stuff of life. Like, like we just spend our time in it, you know, and God like is active in our life and with the poverty, with the work of the poor, et cetera. And so the fruit of that are all of these stories, all of these witnesses sort of in line with St. John, who says like, this is what I've seen, what I've touched, what I've heard. Like, and, and so this, I believe like it's super integrated. It's, it's the, the Franciscan total pursuit of Jesus, but mm -hmm. also part of our, how the father loves us and like what he wants to give to the world is by showing his fatherhood and the real stuff of life so that we can bear witness and testimony to it in, in our preaching and hopefully how we live. Well, I'm rocking you know, the sock religious uh, St. Francis socks right now. And as I'm <laughs> listening to you, just I'm imaging the prison bars of St. Francis's paternal home chapel in Assisi as you're sharing that and the dichotomy between where our earthly fathers wound us most deeply and where the father's mercy through the cords of salvation comes to set us free from those prison bars and how he was cloaked with the with the bishops in his nakedness and his renouncement uh, as he was cloaked in the father's care in the in the form of the ministry of of the bishop it's just like oh, i'm so stoked that that's how you began the book beautiful but it's, it's also like the the when you started out you you said how God was so invested in us. And I can't think of a bigger investment than to send your son to suffer yeah. for us. Mm -hmm. And 
I look at my own children and how I invest my time with them and it's not perfect. Um, but I do also see the wounds that are created when, even if it's not an investment of my time, that's practical, that's not being invested with them. It still has an impact on them. So I have to come back to them, reinvest that time. I, I just see that, that phenomenon in their lives, you know, um, and, and to, to carry that into, and these are like mostly very practical things in their lives, but it means so much to them. And to look at like the investment that God made just for our salvation, which is a, you know, it's the same thing, so to speak, just that investment that he made with us is by far any attention I can give my children currently. But in this story, this guy gave it specifically to his child. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. Father Mark Mary, you mentioned something earlier that I thought was a really interesting statement that I didn't want to gloss over. And this has kind of been one of my pet psychological analyses of people for a long time is that people generally tend to view God the Father in the cast and in the icon of their own father. And conversely, they tend to view the church in the, the view of their mother, right? That's like in a very broad sense. I mean, when you get to talk to people, they either protective of the church because it's a mother or they're, they feel there's too many rules because of mother, whatever, but their view of their father informs their view of God, the father. Um, how did you find that in researching his, in these stories? How do you find that a person's practical experience of their own father impacts their view of God, the father? I just, I think it's, I think it's just true. Right. And um, particularly our, our parents and what we can keep focused on our, mm -hmm. our, earthly fathers here, like in so many of those experiences are going to set the tone about whether or not like the world is safe, like whether or not we're in it alone, whether or not we have to look out, like it's, it's, it's me, myself and I against the world. Like those, like if we, if we didn't have a good dad who was with us, that's kind of how we approach others. And then ultimately it's going to be how we approach God. Right. And, and that's, and that's just real. And, uh, but again, like the, the important thing for me is just that, like, again, that like the desire, and I'm kind of using this language, like the, the desire you have for a perfect father is that they're actually promises and the promises that are fulfilled in the heavenly father. Mm -hmm. And so there's, there's hope and there's healing and there's wholeness, like in, in the fatherhood of God. And maybe to back up for a second is uh, the catechism of the Catholic church pretty early on, it says that after the fall. All subsequent sin is, is a result of disobedience and a lack of trust in the goodness of God or in God's goodness, which is like, which is the father wound, like the father God wound is like, we just don't trust that God is good. And, you know, the catechism says that's why we sin. And so I do think healing that father wound, knowing God, the father, knowing his goodness is, is core and central and foundational to actually repentance and holiness and conversion. And that path too, I've had the experience of that um, with people very close to me. That path sometimes takes a lifetime. You know, like, I mean, I had my conversion on one of your retreats. Uh, and uh, this was in 2000, I believe in one or something. And uh, I realized I had a lot of wounds. And then the, the, the next thing is, is I realized that I had an earthly father. And then I saw them as the father saw me. I saw my sin and how God forgave me. And then I saw them in that same light, but, and it changed my life, but it continually comes up in your life where, you know, you reflect on something that you're, you're, you know, vacillating from anger to peace or like you're making decisions. And I, a lot of times in recollection of that, I still realize that I still have the remnants of that wound. And so the path to this father, to our father sometimes is a, is a life's journey, you know? You know, one of the things that I love in the mass, right, is that uh, when we're about to say the Our Father, it's we dare to say, right, and that trust, that we dare to say that this omnipotent, completely beyond the capacity of the human mind to even begin to comprehend, but we dare to say in a familiar way, Dad, Our Father, Right. Like Jesus would say, Abba, in a very familiar, gentle way, not, you know, Lord God, King of hosts, you know, throwing lightning bolts. Right. But father in a gentle, gentle, tender way. 
that's such a difference from just about any other religious structure that's ever existed in the world, that there is a gentleness, a love, and a pursuit of the deity of his creation in a way that any father would be able to understand that how they pursue their children, how they love their children. Um, Talk about not glossing over anything though, but I think that slip of, of your, of a Freudian slip that you just had, like that this is also revealed in a gender, like this is revealed in a father. This is revealed in the masculinity of what a father provides. And it kind of mm. ties into the chords of what you were saying, Father Mark Mary too. But I, I'd love to hear what your thoughts are just like listening to what Shield just said. But with that slip, you know, God is- What's the slip? <laughs> what did yeah. I say? What did, you what did I say? Gentle? You said gentle, but like it was, you said gender and then you recorrected yourself and you said- Okay, okay. Gentle. And okay. and it's like you know a lot of times the misappropriation of 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 masculinity and that sense of mm -hmm. like aggression or tough or that that the father provides a sense of security by by violence and there is that sense of defense and fortification and and being able to handle you know you know fight off the wolves fight off the evils but there's also the sense of tenderness and gentleness as you're saying Sheil. Um, that gives a qualitative nature of security is manifested through mercy. Security is manifested through the father's love more so than any type of like wrath or like straight up like thunderbolts and lightning and slaying dragons, you know, like it's, it's that type of, it's that type of love. Yeah. And, and I love this guys and, and bringing the two together. Cause I, and I think there is an order to it. You know, I do think that it's not by accident, like in the natural world, that we come into the world totally dependent and like we experience being loved when all we can do is right, like eat food and sleep and like fill up diapers, you know, like there, there's an order to that. Eventually, like a spiritual, like a biological dad, biological parents, this, this, this baby's going to grow and you have to teach them. And ultimately, you're going to have to teach them how to be a mature adult, which includes doing hard things. Right. Like you can't baby them their whole lives or it's actually going to like undercut their maturation and undercut actually their potential for happiness in this world. And so I think I, I do. Like, I think there's something to that in the spiritual life. Like I do think it's important that we know that we're loved. Like when we're totally broken and totally sinful and the father sees us and he loves us and he loves to care for us. And it's like we don't have to earn his love. We can't earn his love. And there, and so that that's one component of the fatherhood of God. And this is one like as we dare to call him father, like it's really beautiful that he loves us like that, that tenderly and that intimately, but also like a father in his masculinity, like a father is also going to equip us and form us. And part of that is, is like teaching us uh, to grow in discipline, to, to grow in our ability to die to ourselves, to grow to our ability to, to do hard things. And um, I like one of the things, so I work in formation or I have worked in formation for the last four years. I'm with seminarians now, but I used to be with our, our new brothers. And one of the things we do with our postulants with the new guys is we go on this three week uh, desert trip with it's, it's group called core, which is out of Wyoming Catholic. And you go out to Utah and you're just, you're in the desert, you're backpacking. There's no shower for three plus weeks. Um, we're up early. Like it's pretty cold. One of the morning, like we had whole hour, mass and holy hour and it's like six degrees outside and you're out there in it and right like why we do that is because for these men to live this vocation well and to persevere in it um part of it is like they're gonna have to be able to do hard things right and so the father loves them gives them a space gives them permission to be broken and to be needy but also a father is going to guide you and form you and teach you um to do hard things and i think it's gaudium at spes we misquote it all the time right like that you are not uh, you're not the sort of the, the value of like your sins and your weakness, but of the father's love for you. And then the second part is, and your ability to love like the son. And so these are the two things like you're loved in your poverty, but also like the grace of your father wants to transform you and strengthen you and feel you and heal you so that you can also, you know, be like love and lay your life down. Mm. Mm. Well, Mark Barry, if I can ask, you know, how did your your father form your view of God the Father? You know, what what's your personal situation? What kind of perspective did that have on this book? And I, I actually, I, it's my it's the uh, 
I, what, I don't know what you call those opening words who you like dedicate it to, to my dad, whose fatherhood made believing in God as a good and loving father, the easiest thing in the world. Um, you know, I had a good dad. I really did. And for me, trusting God, uh, feeling free to be safe, feeling free to pursue a vocation, which nobody like nobody else around me was pursuing. I really think that came from like the foundation laid by my dad. He wasn't the most spiritual guy. Like we weren't praying together or whatever, but he was good and he was faithful and he was there for me and he was hardworking and he was dependable and he was trustworthy, all that stuff. So 100%, I think the foundation that was laid for my own relationship with God as father was from like just having a really, really good dad. That's awesome. <clears throat> so in this book, um, you know, there's Ryan and I who are both biological fathers and, you know, full-time fathers. We, we do the whole thing, but you know, what could maybe somebody who has a different vocation in life, who, you know, to the priesthood, like father rich or somebody who's, you know, discerning their call, what can they get out of this book as far as their, the fatherhood in their own life, or, you know, even for the, the you know, as a subsequent question, what can women get out of this as well? Because, you know, women need fathers too. We've been kind of approaching this very much as a group of sons. But I'm yeah. sure women have father needs that are different than what I would have experienced. So, you know, shed a little bit on that, if you would. It's natural, like hearing the title. I probably a lot of uh, people who hear it the first time are going to assume it's a book like for fathers, for dads about how to do it better. But uh, that's just not what it is, right? It's a, it's a I would say it's a book for sons and daughters. And um, it's a book of sons and daughters who desire to know their earthly father. And so I think that that is going to apply to to priests. It's going to apply to dads. It's going to apply to women. It's going to apply to daughters, sisters, etc. Right. And so you know, throughout the book, uh, like the stories, they have they have they have boys, they have girls, they have sons, they have daughters, they have those who are like adopted, those who were have a variety of disabilities. Like, um, yeah. So it's for anyone. I would say it's for anyone who who wants to know. Uh, God the Father, and so I think that's for everybody. And that's I love that because everybody is a son, everybody's a daughter that's listening in right now. And you need to get this book because really we all we all thrive in the Father's love. And the fact that each of these stories and each of these illustrations and your pastoral care and one telling the story, but also establishing kind of that theological icon to look through the lens of these testimonies and these powerful stories so that we can get to really have that avenue of encounter with God manifesting his love so powerfully. And it is to strike the heart and bring healing to the heart. And, you know, I, I remember being at IPF Institute of Priestly Formation, which is at Creighton University back in 2008. And we went through the eight day silent retreat and the microcosm St. Ignatius and and locked into some imaginative prayer and, and worked with Father Horn this one particular day, just random providential, like I was on the side of the church just praying in silence and, and really meditating on the scriptures from Mass. And then he came and sat down next to me and he kind of led me through this meditation and just, I was off to the races. And what happened was my heart was addressed by God very directly. And, and my heart was healed through the intercession and example of St. Joseph, where, you know, a lot of the wounds within my heart were completely met by God, the Father's love, and expressing that I've always been there. Like, and looking at my history and my memory bank and seeing how God, the Father, was there for me through through everything. Um, you know, I considered like, wow, I've been, you know, how you're, I've been healed of my father wound. You know, I've been healed of my father wound, but that's not the case. Like that massive wave of healing was tremendous, but the interior nature of our hearts. God has greater depth to accomplish in you. So even if you've gone through a father wound healing experience through, you know, charismatic circles or or different prayer experiences or reading the scriptures, this is going to be helpful to you to to continue that interior work. And you know, it's been true for me. I'm I'm curious for you, Father Mark Mary, but like it's been very true that God has pursued me ever since that moment in making that more deeply enriching in my own experience of him, even to this present day, the way that I'm experiencing the Father's mercy in my life is, is far superior than 2008. And even though it is harder and it's more challenging and, and, and complex, 
but that's the beauty of God's love. It knows no bounds. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think there's, um, I don't have the quote before me. It's this, it's like, it's like to say, saving souls. Something like this. It's this book by this uh, priest named father Casey. And he was a novice master, I believe for Benedictines. And it's, it's just a, it's a, it's a book for novice masters, but I think it's really, really awesome. Novice master is the guy who's basically working with the, the young men just beginning formation in religious life. Right. And he, he basically says like, I don't know if, um, if the Christian life is so much a journey first and foremost of self-improvement, but a, a growing dependence on the mm. mercy of God. Amen. Right. And I've been a religious now for 15 years and I came into it to like be perfect and to be a saint and to be, you know, the most virtuous guy like right now. And, uh, well that did like, you know, that didn't work out. Right. <laughs> and, um, but more and more, my experience is, one of a growing awareness of the reality of how dependent I am on the mercy of God. If and, we... um, and so, yeah, I think, I think that's like, it's consistent with what you're sharing father rich. Oh, it's so, it's so true. And then it's like, when you look at the saints, we start to have solidarity with them, not in like this kind of, uh, marker and crayon and like pastel and stained glass window type of like oh that guy was perfect saint francis was perfect it's like no when you start looking at saint Fra saint francis would preach his sinfulness you know when people were like oh he's a saint he's a saint he would get up there and self-humiliate and completely manifest his conscience in front of everybody and mortify himself and when you realize it is it is the dependency like you said it's so beautiful it's the dependency on the father's mercy manifesting in your life day to day and that's i i just came across the scriptures uh from matthew's gospel and i'd love to be able to crack open the scripture because it just speaks so powerfully and it's jesus healing the paralytic so if you're out there this is matthew 9 and this is right when he's going back to Capernaum. So after getting into the boat, he crossed the sea and came to his own town. And whenever Jesus is saying that, that he's going to Capernaum, like that's his, that's the center post of his ministry. That's his hometown. And just as then some people were carrying a paralyzed man lying on a bed, when Jesus saw their faith, he, he said to the paralytic, take heart, son, your sins are forgiven. I love that. Take heart, son, like this kind of eternal cord of expression. Then some of the scribes said to themselves, this man is blaspheming. But Jesus, perceiving their thoughts, said, why do you think evil in your hearts? For which is easier to say, your sins are forgiven? Or to say, stand up and walk. But so that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He then said to the paralytic, stand up, take your bed, and go to your home. And he stood up and went to his home. And when the crowd saw this, they were filled with awe and they glorified God. And this is this is my favorite, this is my favorite line. Who had given such authority to human beings. And it's just so beautiful. Like God the Father gives this authority to human beings to ex extend mercy. And Jesus is expressing the Father's love so beautifully in saying, Son, this paralytic, in that in that context. His, his paralysis was due to sin. That's what everybody's mentality was. And then how does the father respond to our sin? How does the father respond to our paralysis in life? It's like, it's exactly what you're describing in your testimony. It's like, it's ever present. It's omnipotent. It's unfathomable mercy just pouring down in our souls, creating that dependency. He forms a home. You know, Ryan, we were talking the other day about uh, Sister Faustina's diary, and you brought up that one quote to me. Do you remember what you were saying about mm -hmm. the greatest sinners? Yeah, I mean, we're all bad at quoting stuff unless we have scripture. Uh, <laughs> we, need to write, uh, we need to write it in front of us. <laughs> but and, and maybe, Father Rich, you know more about, about this. But uh, yeah, Jesus said to her um, that the person that's in the worst sin uh, in humanity has the greatest right to my mercy mm -hmm. and i thought that was a beautiful economy of humanity and god's mercy you know mm -hmm. spoken like a prioritization himself was yeah. that like a prioritization like look it's a triage like the person who is the worst sinner is the one deserving of his mercy the most and i think that's a big thing that we experience in our father wounds and in our perception of god is that 
oftentimes we hide. You know, what did, what did you know, Adam and Eve do? They hid. Immediately, your reaction to sin is to hide away and conceal. But who told you you're naked, right? Who told you you're in sin, right? You know, if if we could just go and trust that God is forgiving us, there would be so much more healing in our culture and so much more um, growth in our our culture. Yeah, culture. So, Father Mark Mary, like, how do you see the father wound and then the lack of understanding of God the Father affecting society as a whole? You know, because I mean, I think it's pretty apparent that there's a problem there. Yeah, absolutely. I'm trying to think of like wh where to begin, right? Where to, where to yeah, point? Yeah, sure. Um, I I think I'll start with this idea and then kind of get to it. And I think it touches on what, what Father Rich was sharing a little bit about kind of one way of looking at the paralytic and the healing of the paralytic. It's kind of more and more I'm convinced that um, Catholics, Catholics, Christians, but we kind of have like an out of order, like a disordered approach to repentance. And and the idea I have is this: is that like pretend you got a bad hip and so you're limping. Is sometimes we treat like repentance, like I got, to, I'm going to stop limping. Like, so what am I going to do? I'm just going to stop limping. And it's like, well, you keep, you, you keep doing that. But if you don't fix the hip, like you're not going to fix the actual problem. But if you go, if you go to the hip and you fix the hip naturally as a byproduct, you're going to stop limping. And so I do think actually, like we, we want to get to the core, like what is the core wound and the core issue, right? And then the paralytic, again, this is kind of a little bit of like, not exactly the sort of literal meaning of the scripture, but it begins with, okay, your sins are forgiven and then get up and walk, right? Like, okay, let's get to the, the core issue and then we'll have like a behavior change as, as a fruit of that. Mm -hmm. And so I think, you know, for the world, looking at the world, maybe I'll use, I'll pull an anecdote from the story and it's from our homeless shelter in the Bronx. This guy gets in and uh, he joins us. He just got out of prison. He'd been in prison for like 20 years. And so while he's with us at the very beginning, he's acting like he would in prison, which is basically like, it's like me versus against the world. And so he's got this edge. He's always kind of ready to fight. He's kind of, he's, he's projecting this, like I'm dangerous, stay away thing. Right. Um, and, and he's just kind of angry and tough and harsh. One of the things we do in the shelter is uh, we celebrate the guy's birthdays. And so after being with us for a little bit and just really being tough and not very like, uh, he didn't work with like our authorities very well. Um, it was his birthday. So in front of all, all the guys, we, we bring out a birthday cake with his name on it and start singing happy birthday. And as the song ends, like he, before he's able to blow out the candles, he breaks down in tears. And he says, I've never had a birthday cake with my name on it. And this is like a 40 or 50 year old guy. And immediately, like from that point forward, like he softened. He became sort of more docile. He he like became more friendly, right? And so this guy had this wound of I'm in it alone. The world's a dangerous place. It's me against everybody. And the fruit of that was like violence, aggression, harshness, disobedience, etc. When he knew we cared for him and he loved him and we knew and we knew him, like he softened. He became compassionate. He became receptive. And so that's like one of the things in the world. There's just so many people in the world out there who like feel like feel like it's a war zone and feel like it, they're in it alone and they have to fight for what's theirs and no one's going to give them anything. They have to take it, this whole thing. And that just be then then um, then you're my enemy and you're my enemy and you're my enemy as opposed to my brother. And so I do think if we come to this core of like God is good and God is father and he sees you and he loves you. Uh, a fruit of that is going to be repentance. It can be behavior change. Hmm. Beautiful. That is so inspiring, man. That's, my heart is just dilated right now. Just what a, what a beautiful gift you friars are, Ben, the work Thanks. that you do. It's so inspiring to me. So father, Mark, Mary, uh, do you have a copy of the book? Can you show everyone what this looks like? Got it right here. Yeah. Oh, the father. Oh, nice so, cover art, man. That's yeah. sharp. Yeah, just so, threw that up in my spare time. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know CFRs had spare time. I thought that you guys were always on, on call. <laughs> um, where can they find this book? You know, um, where where do they go to learn more about number one, what you're doing, and then this book? Yeah, I think uh, if for the physical copies, the place to begin right now is Ascension Press, ascensionpress.com forward slash the father. Um, eventually, it'll be on Amazon if people use Amazon. It got, I don't know how much time we have, but it got released a little funny. early by like a, can I tell you this, just like a random funny we have, story? We have as much time as you want. 
Because it's so it's out right now. But if you go to Amazon, it's not in yet because it wasn't mm -hmm. supposed to be out. Um, but through a bit of like a relationship, just doing some stuff with Hallow, I got connected to them. And mm -hmm. they do this whole thing with like Mark Wahlberg for Lent and, and Jonathan Rumi. And part of it is going on talk shows on Ash Wednesday to promote their thing. And um, but, but they have to have mass early in the morning because it's like it, it's before churches are open to get on the shows. And so through a connection, I, I did that for them this year. And I brought a couple of copies of my book and gave it to, to Mark Wahlberg and Jonathan Rumi uh, just to have whatever. And then they posted these videos of them just like holding it. Like the picture is just like this. The video is just them both holding it like this. They don't say anything about the book, but they're just like. And uh, and so then we're like, well, I guess we got to release the book now, you know, take advantage of this. Yeah. Um, so I guess, yeah, Mark, Mark Wahlberg released the book before I read it. Um, but we I appreciate it. I mean, those Wahlberg stories cool. too. <laughs> yeah. That's hilarious, man. Uh, yeah, we actually had the same, we had a miss, uh, adventure in time with Mark Wahlberg. So, uh, I think that maybe, maybe that revolves around him. Yeah, um, <laughs> that's true. So yeah, there's going to be a link here so that you can take a look at that and you can go check this book out. Uh, this book is a really important and I think a really fruitful book for everybody out there. I mean, we all need to get closer to the father. So I, I'm really appreciative that you're making this available. Now, mm -hmm. uh, one thing I did want to mention since you mentioned it is Hollow. So Hollow is one of our sponsors. We've been working with them since the very beginning of our show. And if you go to catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow, you can go and download that app 100% free and try out all the premium features for a trial period and see if it's something that can impact your prayer life like it has impacted ours. There's so many different features on there. There's so many great people like Jonathan Rumi, Mark Wahlberg, Bishop Barron, all different types of prayer, music, meditation, sleep aids, uh, the full Bible. They have groups. They have all sorts of things. So we really can't recommend it enough. Again, so catholictalkshow.com forward slash hollow. Um, and you can try that out and, and see if it can impact your life like it has over, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of people who have downloaded the app. Um so, you know, uh, just going now, circling back to the book, um, how long of a book, how long of a read is this? What can people expect when they crack this open? You know, is how do you recommend they read it? Should they go chapter by chapter and take a break and reflect or just tear right through it? You know, do you have a any advice on reading it? Yeah, you could read it pretty quick. You could fly through it. Um, the hope is that you don't do that. Um and so, so it is, it's broken up into like, again, 30 sort of chapters and the proposed best practice would be to do one at a time. And, and the reason for it is to actually like, if you will, to receive the grace, to receive the gift being offered each, each reflection, each chapter, I do think gives an, a particular unique insight into one component of the heart of God. And it probably, you know, if you just kind of fly through it, um, you probably take one away from the book as opposed to 30 from the book. And so the invitation is to make it a little bit of a retreat, maybe just part of your morning prayer, your night prayer, whatever it is. Um, but to kind of to take it a little bit at a time is, is the hope. That's the talking. It's funny that I'm reflecting on IPF so much uh, in this conversation. But when I read the wellspring of worship, um, you know, on, on liturgy and we were we were told like and in the seminary it's like you're just powering through books or like undergrad philosophy you're just powering through books and you're writing and it's like just massive input output but they're like slow down read a paragraph and go pray about it and you know i would love to hear your reflection father martin mary like when you were writing it you know and and moving through each of these chapters and your hope as a as a writer is for your reader to really absorb each of these chapters and really be transformed in their encounter of the Father's love. For you personally, um, as a son of the Father who loves you, writing these chapters, reflecting on the prism and the and the multifaceted expression of of the Father's love for you, what was that grace like for you writing it, and and how did it help? Form your own identity and knowledge of self as being loved by the father. Yeah, I'm still in it. I'm still mm. in it, you know? And, um, yeah, my, it, it's just a huge gift and grace. And right now my, if you will, my spiritual place, like where I am, uh, is I'm just, you know, the prodigal son who's returned and now who's in like 
like the father's like throwing him this big party, this big celebration. Mm -hmm. And he's, you know, the, the guest of honor, but just like 20 minutes ago, he just returned and it was this public, you know, like everybody there knows he's a sinner and knows it. And it's just like, what is that experience? Like, uh, like what's going on with that son in that place and the, mm. and, and the fight to hold on to shame and to doubt and to guilt and to self-accusation when the father just wants you to receive his forgiveness and his celebration, you know? And so that's certainly a theme in the book. And that's just kind of where I am. And, and so much of just what's happening in my life is just again and again and again, the father's just like blessing me of like, mm. I'm going to love you and remind you who you are and remind you of your dignity yes. by just like blessing you and blessing you and blessing you yes. until you get it until you've, until you, you know, actually <laughs> receive the whole point of yes. this that you're my beloved son. Yes. So that's, that's where I'm at right now. Yeah. And it's like, it's, it's true in the, in the human heart, we can kind of resist, you know, and press back like, no, I'm not worthy of that love. Like I'm not, I'm not and like that resistance is totally there. And, and, uh, but it is, it's like these massive waves of mercy, like going back to Faustina, it's these like massive waves of mercy crashing in. And, and I just shared the story of JP two walking into a church at St. John Paul II is when he's Pope. And, and, uh, you know, he walks in and he recognizes this beggar at the door of the church and he sees him, he recognizes his face and he starts interacting with him. And it was a priest who had been stripped of his faculties, you know, just ousted and, and made some mistakes, just heartbroken, just like, you know, desperate, like just street poverty, like, and JP two pulls him in and, and here's this confession. And it's just this heartfelt exchange of love and mercy and the father's care. And he reinstates his faculties and then kneels down and goes to confession to that, that disparate priest and that, that, that priest who had been stripped of all, all of his faculties, like, it it is these it's these stories and these manifestations that mm. that happen in the world and that's what this book's all about it's like this is literally god the father giving us the illustrations and the expressions of his love through the cords of human experience why would you not want to pour yourself into that type of a reflection because that's what we're made for we were absolutely made for that mm. I can't so, wait to get my copy because I'm, I'm yeah. So yeah, yeah, well, we'll see if we'll get it. But yeah, let's Father, get it in the middle. Can, yeah, can you give us that <laughs> link again? Oh, the link again. Yes, ascensionpress.com forward slash the Father. All right. So again, that's going to be here on the screen, um, right here about now. I'll put it right there, and then it'll be below, so you cannot miss it. Go out and get this book. Um, I'm sure that every one of us listening and participating here has more work to do to more closely, you know, cleave themselves to the father. So this is a great opportunity, particularly at this time of year, as we're, you know, going through Lent and working towards Easter. Um, like you said, it's probably not a very long read, but I think there's a lot that you can get out of it. Uh, Father Mark Mary, we really appreciate you coming on, taking time out um, to speak about this book and, and to have this conversation. Uh, we'd love to have you on again. And again, to everyone listening, make sure you go out and get this book. Um, can't recommend it enough. Yep, ascensionpress.com. And make sure that you're praying for these beautiful CFRs doing such incredible work around the world. Give my give my dear brother, brother nostrils, father PT, my love. I miss him. <laughs> and uh, you know, I hope we could get him on the show one of these days too. So press oh. him in, in that way. And and um, you know, to all of our listeners out there, to all of our followers on YouTube, you know, if you haven't hit the thumbs up on this, you know, come on, give a thumbs up for the father's love hit the subscribe button, click the little bell. We're here every week with you at the Catholic Talk Show, just breaking up the beauty of our faith and today just being able to share the beauty of the Father's love for you. So Father Mark Mary, would you be able to lead us out in prayer and just, you know, that calling down the Father's love on each of us? And, and we want that to really move your hearts out there, brothers and sisters who are listening in. You know, we are all one in Christ before the Father and his love, and we are brothers and sisters in this you know, and, and he wants us to be one. So let's receive your blessing, my dear brother. Amen. Through the prayers of all the angels and the saints, especially St. Francis, St. Clair, our Lady of Guadalupe, may all of you receive a new experience uh, of God's fatherhood and his love and care for you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. 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 Thank you for joining us, Father Mark Mary, and to everybody out there, this is the Catholic Talk Show. We'll see you next week. Amen.